the Bible, we're continuing our study in the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 1. Have you ever heard a word or witnessed something that moved you? Moved you in the sense of your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your actions, your will? You experience something and it moves you. I think about the Grand Canyon. When I first laid eyes on the Grand Canyon, that happened to me. My thoughts, the wonder, I, I couldn't even, you can't even hardly control yourself, right, in these kind of moments. It's like emotions and, 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 and I don't, words and sounds started just coming out of me. Like, oh man, you know, just all. Maybe recently I had a friend, his team, won a championship, I think maybe the first championship, and he, I felt like it was sort of a confessional time, he said that he was moved to tears, he was moved to tears, his team <laughs> had won finally, you know, moved in thought, emotion, in action, uh, maybe, you know, when your fiance says yes, or you hear those words, finally, will you, yes, and you're moved, in thought, in emotions, and in action. The scene today is a moving scene. It's a beautiful scene of God's faithful promises, of uh, His faithfulness and goodness and His gospel and uh, carried out in this scene. It is a moving scene. And by God's grace, as we read His Word, as we consider His Word today, by His grace, we in view of God's mercy, tender mercies displayed in this text, we'll be moved into a life of worship as we leave today. So if you are able, let's stand and read Luke 1. We're going to cover all the way to verse 80. But in, in this section here, let's read 57 through 66 of Luke chapter 1. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And notice verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we do ask by your grace that you illuminate it to us. God, that it would be life to us. That it would be our very food this morning as we look to you. And God, uh, as, as I just said, God, help us to not simply be hearers today, but let us be doers of your word as we leave. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I am uh, aspiring to this morning is uh, to consider this whole text, and we'll read the song, the prophecy of Zechariah in a second, uh, but to notice a promised son, uh, to notice a song of salvation, and to notice a piercing sunrise, a piercing sunrise. So here in this section, 57 through 66, and we'll consider 80, a promised son in the celebration. Notice in verse 14, right, that prophetic word given to Zechariah uh, and to Elizabeth, that joy and gladness will come to you through a child, this aged couple. Beyond childbearing years, God was going to miraculously provide a child for them. And, and it would bring joy and gladness to them. And many will rejoice. That's what's taking place here. The fulfillment of this promised child uh, 
John the Baptist, right? Born to Elizabeth and Zechariah. And so the scene is there for us. The time had come. Family and friends gathered, right? And uh, in, in awe of God's provision, of his mercy towards Elizabeth uh, and, and to Zechariah. And so uh, you, you have uh, the, uh, the, the dad, right? Zechariah, who was disciplined by the Lord for his unbelief. He didn't believe. The Lord, And so the Lord graciously disciplined him so he couldn't speak. And as we see in this text, he couldn't hear either. And so for nine months, he had been silent. I kind of had a, it's kind of a humorous thought, but it may have played to his advantage that he couldn't speak while his wife was enduring uh, all those nine months and, and the delivery. Uh, I made the mistake uh, when Evangeline was born, before she was born, I shushed Shelly. And that was a mistake, I assure you. And so, yes, I see you shaking your head. Um, you know, and so maybe that played to his advantage. He couldn't speak. But, but it was the Lord's gracious discipline uh, towards him. And so, but God had shown great mercy. Um, and, and I'll just pause to say this for a second. As he graciously provided for Elizabeth and Zechariah, man, I know probably like many of you, I have witnessed and seen God graciously provide for those who desire a child. Graciously provide for those who've desired a child who have been unable. I've seen, I've seen those unable in, in, in 18 years later, God suddenly gives them a child. What? You know, and a son. Uh, gave this couple a son. I've seen those unable to have children. God used that to stir them towards adoption, a double provision, a child and a father and a mother, and then have biological children after they had adopted. I've seen those stirred towards adoption, unable, and God provide a whole van load full of children through adoption. And God's grace and mercy at work in, in those families. I've seen uh, folks who were unable, like, uh, be stirred towards uh, the care for the destitute children. That God would use that to move them to care for countless children. God's grace and mercy is so awesome. It's sufficient for all of our needs, whatever they are. And God has provided here for Elizabeth and John that would, we would all be reaping the benefits of what he was working here in his plan of redemption. So there is rejoicing. On the eighth day, according to the law, the circumcision takes place and the naming. And you have to smile. You know, you have to smile sometimes when you're reading your Bibles, right? Uh, and we see it's, it's kind of a humorous thing to me because people, family get funny about names, don't we? It's like sometimes maybe you share with a family member, this is the name that we're thinking of. And they go, oh, what do you mean? Oh, I mean, this is, this, this is the name. This will be your, you know, oh, yeah. And it's like here they're going, uh, the Lord has provided a son. His name is Z Jr. It's going to be Zechariah Jr., right? right? That's what you're going to name him. And Elizabeth says, no, we're going to name him John. They're like, what? There's no family member named John. How could you? you? And it's do like our kids do. You go to mom, she says no, so then you go to dad. So they go to dad, and they're like, hey, uh, surely you're going to name him after you, Zechariah. And he says, and it's so cool, in the present tense, his name is John. It's like Zechariah saying, he's already been named. God has named him John, which means Jehovah is gracious. And he is. He has already been named. And then they are moved into fear of God and awe. They're going, oh, God is up to something here. And it says there at the end of that section, they wondered, what is God going to do with this child? And we all wonder that. Right? We hold our children. We're like, what is God going to do with this child? And, and here, what must God be up to? For this child. And then notice verse 80. We see John now in the wilderness, likely orphaned at a young age with older parents, raised by wolves, or, you know, he's like out in the wilderness, and God cares for him like many of the Old Testament prophets, hard, in hard conditions. But it says that he grew physically. And strong in spirit. Well, that's what we pray for our children too. 
They would grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. And that's what God is doing in John the Baptist as he grows there. And when I think of John, I don't know about you. In my mind, I picture a mix of Bear Grylls, Grizzly Adams, and Billy Graham. I just dated myself with some of those. But I picture this just interesting mix of an individual out there. Uh, Jesus would say of John that he was the goat, the greatest of all time. If you don't, you're not familiar with that term, the young people like to use this term goat, the greatest of all time. Jesus said John the Baptist is the goat, right? Not Muhammad Ali or LeBron or whoever, the greatest of all time. Young people drop that in there. Your friends talking about who the goat is say, uh, Jesus said it was John the Baptist, right? We look and say Jesus is the greatest of all time, and no doubt the God-man is. Nobody is greater than Jesus. But Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest, right? No man born of woman is greater than he. Why did he say that? Because Jesus inverts everything, right? The greatest is the least. The weak become strong. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And John said, I must decrease so that he may increase. The greatest and, and the greatness that we all should aspire to, and we should, is to be emptied of the self-life and filled with the Christ life. John's whole life, he's the greatest because his whole life and blood would be spilt pointing to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And we all ought to aspire to that, to be emptied of self, crucified with Christ. We no longer live, but it's Christ that lives within us. That's why John was the greatest. And so, but notice Zechariah's repentance, his faith and obedience. He believes. He's like, oh yeah, you provided, you indeed kept your word, and he is faithful to keep his promises. He said he was going to provide a child, and he did. And then Zechariah, in obedience, names him John. I'm trusting and following you. I believe. And I love how it says immediately his tongue was loosed. It's like God's mercy and his grace. He's ready to forgive, ready to lavish us in his love, ready to empower us by his spirit as we trust in him and look to him. And God fills it. You see him filled with the spirit uh, and, and, and God moves him into praise. He's loosed into praise. He doesn't hasn't spoken for nine months, and he doesn't start with, God, why did you do that? He's moved into praise. He trusts the Lord and believes him. And so in this section, I think we ought to be encouraged to take him at his word. Do not doubt his word. No matter how impossible the thing that you may be facing in, in life, if, if God has said it, it's as good as done. Trust in it. And just as he was faithful to provide here, he is able to provide for us. We can trust him at his word. Our response to God's person and work should be the same as the neighbor's. Reverence and awe. Look at who he is. Look at what he's done. Look at his faithfulness. Reverence and awe. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To fear the Lord and to love him and to go, oh, you are God and you are good and you have provided. And even like Zechariah, moved into praise. Repentance, faith, obedience, worship, praise. It ought to be an ongoing thing in our life, daily, weekly, moved into praise. And then I'll say this, that his plan is carried out when we dis, even when we disbelieve. Isn't that good? When we are faithless, he is faithful. We've sung about it. Even for Zechariah, didn't believe, but God fulfilled his promise. God did what he said he would do, regardless of Zechariah's belief. And that gives us comfort and hope. Too, is we're banking on his strength and his promises and his faithfulness, not our own. We fall short. Jesus does not. So the song. Look at the song here. He's moved into song and prophesied. said he's filled with the Spirit. Let's read this together. It is a chunk, but let's read it together to hear God's Word, to hear this response of worship by Zechariah. I'm going to read 67 through 79. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. 
to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's the word of the Lord. What a beautiful song. And so uh, a few observations Uh, as we've been working through Luke here, is notice there are four incarnation songs. As we saw, I think last week, the song of Mary, and then here of Zechariah, and we'll see the song of angels and Simeon to come. And so this song of salvation, it's all about Jesus. The song is about Jesus. And so, again, God moves the repentant to joy and praise. And, and, and uh, when, when I read this and I picture this whole scene, I can't help into my, my strange mind, I picture Tevi from Fiddler on the Roof. And instead of tradition, it's like he has moved into song and dance and it's salvation, right? Uh, wake up a little bit. Like, and so he has moved into song and dance and to praise unto God. And it's passionate and you just you can't read it without feeling the weightiness of it. This song has been called for centuries now in many uh, Christian traditions, the Benedictus. Uh, And so where Mary's is the Magnificat, this is the Benedictus. uh, The blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. It's what it begins with. Bless, blessed be the Lord God of Israel is what comes out of his mouth. Notice that only two verses are given to John. The song is about Jesus. Only two about his son who's, who's been born. The, the whole song is about Jesus. So 68 and 69, notice there it says that he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us. Isn't that awesome? The Lord has visited us. Has he visited you in his grace and his tender mercy? He visited his people. We see this, even this language in the Old and in the New Testament of God's visitation. And certainly this is what God is doing here. He is visiting his people in the incarnation. Christ has come. He is visited and he is working redemption. And then that, that phrase raised up a horn of salvation. And, and what we need to picture there is, is strength, like a ram's horn or a rhino's horn. What that's pointing to is, is strength. God has come in power, even in his humility and in his gentleness that Jesus came and his lowliness he came, he yet also came in power. He came in power. Psalm 18, 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, the horn of salvation. Jesus is our strong and mighty Savior, the horn of salvation. He has come in power. Jesus in his first advent and his first coming Right? He shows power over demons. He shows power over the wind and the waves. He shows power over sickness. He shows power even over sin and in death. Amen? And he gloriously saves and he saves in power. He, he came to fulfill all the shadows and types, all the promises of God to redeem us. And he has visited us to redeem us. And that's what's taking place. The Lord has visited and redeemed. I do think uh, to to understand uh, uh, the text here in context is to notice the political language, right? You read this text and and, uh, we get hints of a a political type language. And I I, want to put here just this idea of a double deliverance. There's like a double type deliverance. It's one big deliverance, but notice this. Zechariah's allusions to the Davidic king. And to the Abrahamic covenant in this song. In verse 69, he references the house of David. Right there, we know this is not about John. This is about Jesus. The house of David. The mouths of the prophets of old. 
uh, in, in 70. 72, the mercy he promised to our fathers. In verse 73, the oath to Abraham, some 1,800 years previous. This fulfillment of this prophecy of the Messiah to come, this deliverance to come. First Peter 1, 2 says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, they longed to see who this would be, when this would come. They looked to this deliverer, to this deliverance. And so I think it's reasonable to think that Zechariah had uh, one big earthly deliverance, this, this heavenly and earthly deliverance, uh, but certainly in mind, a deliverance from Rome from the oppression of Rome. This is probably hard for us to connect with in our context to some degree, but if you think about the people of God, the people of Israel and they have known oppression, they have known difficulty. And in this context under Rome, a difficult time for the people of God and certainly Zechariah has got to be thinking of like Exodus 6:6 6, 6, where God delivered his people out of Egypt. He said, "I will bring you out from the Egyptians." And so certainly he's thinking of this type of deliverance, that they may worship God in peace, that they may worship him freely in faith and obedience. But we saw even with the deliverance out of Egypt, the deliverance of, from slavery and bondage in Egypt, it was temporary. And the people of God turned and rebelled and, and God graciously sent them into exile. And if, to, to continue to, to, to deal with the difficulties of a foreign oppressors. And they felt the weight of this, this foreign oppression and this longing, this anticipation that the Messiah is going to come and, and, and free us from this oppression. But Zechariah here too also refers not just that oppression politically from that uh, uh, freedom from and deliverance from that uh, political type oppression, but even the oppression of sin. Right, he refers to that later in the text, and so uh, so this second coming, though, and AJ referenced it. The second coming is when we will realize this in full. This prophecy here, we will realize it in full at the second coming, where all the wicked kingdoms of this world will be put under the feet of Jesus, and we look to that day, to the inauguration of the kingdom of God in full. We know it in part now. We'll know it in full then. Amen? And we look to that day. He's going to put every wicked uh, king and ruler right under his feet, uh, and we'll have and be able to worship freely without fear in full, in holiness, uh, and, and in righteousness, to worship him and follow him and serve him in fullness then. And we look to that day. Jesus would come in the first ad advent, though, to address really the primary issue. And it wasn't Rome. It was sin. It was our own sin. And that's still true today. But make no mistake, we long for that second coming, don't we? Turn on the news and they're like, things are not as they should be. The world is wicked and broken and it affects us all. And we long for this deliverance to come. But we know first and foremost, the major deliverance we need is from sin and death, from the bondage of sin and its destruction. And thankfully, Jesus came to address that very issue. Why does he come? Verse 74, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. The only way that happens is to have the sin issue of our heart addressed. In holiness and righteousness, we need a new heart. And Jesus came to provide this atonement, this sacrificial death, defeating sin and death. And he came and has brought salvation, has redeemed his people. Notice the song is even spoken in the past tense. It's as if it's happened, right? It's, all, it's as if it's as good as happened. All of this, this deliverance, and we believe that and live in that and, 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 and look to him in the day-to-day -day and join Zechariah in this song. 76 through 79, notice the piercing sunrise, the contrast of darkness to light. I don't know if you've caught many sunrises in your life, but especially on like a new moon night, the darkness, and then that sunrise coming up, Oh, and if, and, and if you've dealt with the difficulty of darkness, a dark night where you can't see and it's stumbling around, getting around, and that light changes everything, doesn't it? This contrast of a piercing sunrise. And so we, we need to read this, I think, 
to this section here, having in mind, it's almost as if, I don't know for sure, but that Zechariah is even holding John in his arms as he sings this song, right? And he gets to this section. Let's read it again, 76 and 77. He says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of of their sins. It's as if Zechariah knew that his son, that he's holding in his arms now, would come to prepare the way that he, he is holding in his arms the fulfillment of Malachi 3 that said, see, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. He says there in verse 77, he knows that John has come to give his people the knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of their sins. John's preaching was a preaching of repentance, was a preaching of the awareness of sin. It's almost like he stood, he stood in the wilderness and said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, right? And, and just over and over and thousands came and, and responded to this preaching, this preaching of repentance and a baptism of repentance and, and believe, but it's, it's as if John was coming to raise the awareness of our need for a savior, to raise the awareness of our sin. And it's true, the gospel is not good news until we understand that. Until you recognize your need for a savior, until you, wretch, until you recognize how wretched I am apart from God, the severity and the, the depths of my sin before a high and holy God, until we recognize that, we, we, we aren't even mindful that we'll be saved from what, right? But it's we need salvation from sin. And John brought that preaching and, and enlightened the people of God to see their needs so that when Jesus did show up on the scene, right, John would proclaim, right, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Your sins can be removed through Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so it all set up to point to Jesus. He, John had some real comforting words for even the religious elite. He called them out too. Everybody was fair game to John, right? He looked at the religious elite and he said, you brood of vipers. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look really good on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones. You need a new heart. No amount of religious activity can save you. No amount of good deeds can outweigh your bad. You need a Savior. You need in your deadness of your sins to be raised into life by the Spirit of God. You need Jesus. Jesus would continue this teaching, even in Matthew 5, raising our awareness of the depths of our sin, that it's not just simply external, it's internal. Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Any candidates for perfection this morning? Anybody got that down? You've checked all the boxes? No. We all fall shorter than we can even imagine before a holy and a righteous God. We need a Savior. We need forgiveness of sins. And John came and preached to raise that awareness. And he, in verse 78 and 79, this picture, look at 78 and 79, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. I started in 75, didn't I? Uh, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord, prepare his ways. Then notice, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's the fulfillment, I think, of Malachi 4.2, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Certainly Isaiah 9.2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The fulfillment of all of those prophecies from before, the contrast of the darkness of sin and death to salvation and righteousness and life, forgiveness of sins in Christ. The sunrise has come. And for us, for those who've repented and believed in Christ, for us, Colossians 1.13,
He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Delivered. Do you recognize our need for deliverance? Do you recognize our need for that second coming? We feel the weight of it, Shelly and I. Man, we, we just had a moment uh, this past week where we were just connecting with kind of one of those you hear, you hear uh, in, in Christian, Christianese world, we say, come Lord Jesus, come. And it's true, it's biblical. It's like, yeah, man, we need Jesus. The, the world is so dark and in such great need of a Savior. And we have one and he's come. And we can know salvation in the here and now, and we look to that future deliverance from oppression. What do I ask us this morning? Do you have that primary deliverance? Have you experienced that, the forgiveness of sins? Our sins are too heavy for us to bear. The penalty of our sin is too much. Have you cast that burden of the weight of your sin onto Christ and trusted in him and believed upon the Lord Jesus and been saved? Have you been saved from your sins? There's not a greater need that you have than to be liberated from sin and death. And there is a Savior who is ready to forgive you this morning through the person and work of his Son, Jesus Christ, the great horn of salvation who's come in power to deliver you. Have you experienced forgiveness of sins? Are you holding your sins on top of yourself and, 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 and bearing the weight of that penalty on yourself. Cast it upon the Lord Jesus and be saved this morning. Repent and believe. Look to Jesus and be saved. Be made alive. Be born again by His Spirit and look to Him and let Him bear what you cannot bear and deliver you this morning. For the believer, do not continue in sin. Continue in a life of repentance and faith and obedience and joy and praise of our great God who has saved you. And for those in Christ, there is no condemnation. You stand holy and dearly loved before God. He has delivered you from past, present, and future sins. He does not see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Turn, continue to turn in the here and now and look to that whole deliverance that will come in his second coming and continue to pray that by God's grace we would be faithful until that day.